وسلم كما صلى الله عليه وسلم. When we have a question, I would like to We have been blessed and very much honored to be here again at DBS tonight for the second talk in the series of uh, public lectures um, uh, seeking uh, to have a center um, by our most distinguished and uh, very humble speaker uh, who always leaves us wanting to hear more of what he has to say to us, Brother Idris Tawfiq, all the way from Egypt. Before we begin uh, the topic proper, uh, perhaps we would uh, ponder a little bit on the words of God uh, and what He has to say among the many things He has uh, uh, blessed us with regarding the subject matter of today. So, if you could join me in welcoming uh, the colleague for today, who says Mahdi Kandi, who will be reciting to us a few verses from a chapter called um, Surah Yunus. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي جعل الشمس رضياء والقمر
serious enough to, to, to learn more about Allah, we need to read and we need to listen and, and see the things around us. Again, as we said yesterday, our prayer finds us out and the things we do will find us out. And if we're just playing video games all the time, we're not going to learn much about the plan. So take some time to think about faith as a pick of Allah Almighty and, and how we should be made so. So today, when we're talking, we're carrying on from yesterday's talk, the rules of the heart. And we said yesterday how the heart is so important in our faith and how a quiet place is essential if we want to be people of faith, people of prayer, religious men and women. We need to find that oasis in our life. And the oasis could be the mosque where we pray, it could be our, our sitting room where we pray, it could be a park where we sit and recite the Quran. But we surely need a quiet place. I mean, it's the busyness, the busyness of life here in Singapore. Life is very busy. And we need to take time to calm down and, and listen to the voices of Allah in our lives. Today we're talking, the title, the title is The Certitude of Faith. We're talking about interfaith dialogue, about other religions, Islam and other religions. Now that's a difficult one to talk about. For me, I could talk about it like I know the back of my hand. It's as natural to me to talk about it as anything. But for Muslims, often it's something they don't know much about. And it's something they misunderstand completely. So we're going to have to be very sensitive as we approach the issue. And I want to begin to listen very carefully to these words I say now. I bear witness that there is no being worthy of worship but Allah alone. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his slave and final messenger. Please bear in mind, I have said those words at the start. Please don't mistake anything I say tonight in the light of what I said. You know that the greatest, uh, I was introduced, he did this and he did this and he's written this and this and this. He's most certainly not a revert. You know, the sister maybe wasn't here last night. He's not a revert. He embraced Islam 11 years ago. But apart from he did this and this and this, the most important thing I can do is on the day of judgment I can stand before Allah and say, I am a Muslim. So what I have to say to you this evening is as a Muslim man. But it comes to you through the filter of my past. Okay? Now we'll begin. I'm going to begin with a quotation from the new book. In fact, I'm going to read you a page of the new book. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to read you another page from the end of the same section. And this book, this new book, Gift of the Nile, Land of Faith, I said yesterday, it's kind of a tourist guide. If you, if you want to be a tourist, it tells you about all the lovely places in Egypt. But it's a tourist guide written by a Muslim who sees the work of Allah in all of his creation. That's the best way of summing it up. So in this, and there are 52 sections, one for each week of the year. And, and this one is called Standing on Holy Ground, St. Catherine's Monastery, Mount Sinai. Because in the Sinai Desert, at the foot of Mount Sinai, there's a monastery of Greek Orthodox monks. Let, let me read the start of it. And by the end of the evening, the end of my talking, you'll understand why I wrote about it. Of all Egypt's many wonders and historical monuments, St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula is truly unique. Lying in a remote valley at the foot of Mount Sinai, where Moses is said to have received the Ten Commandments, the monastery of the God trodden Mount Sinai has existed for 17 centuries and is the oldest continuously inhabited Christian monastery. The monastery as we know it was founded in the year 527 by the Emperor Justinian, but an earlier building had been constructed in the year 300 when monks, blah, blah, blah. In our own age, wrecked by both religious intolerance and religious indifference, the monastery has a role to play in uniting people of faith and has a message even for those with no faith at all. Christians, Muslims and Jews all adhere in their different ways 
to the story of Moses and the burning bush. The scriptures of all three religions recount how Moses, having killed an Egyptian, goes off to the land of Midian to work as a shepherd. Whilst there tending the flocks, he comes across a burning bush from which God speaks to him. He's told, according to one account, to take off his shoes because the place on which he stands is holy ground. And Muslims read in the Holy Quran the words spoken to Moses. O Moses, verily it is I, Allah, the Almighty, the All-Wise. I'm going to come back to that and make sense of it at the end. But as we begin, we say those words, O Moses, O Ahmed, O Marwa, O Sada, O Yusuf, verily it is I, Allah, the Almighty, the Almighty. Last night I invited you to ask why you are here tonight. What have you given up your Friday night to come to a religious talk for? You know, maybe one of your friends persuaded you to come. You didn't really want to come. But he said, oh, go on, come on, that will go somewhere else when it's finished. We will come here. Or maybe you tell you want to learn more about Islam. Maybe you take, you don't like Islam at all. And you've come really with lots of bad thoughts in your heart about Islam. You've come to find fault with what's been said. I don't know why you're here. But as I said last night, forget what is least of people to say. Listen instead to those words, verily, with your name mentioned, O Idris, O Yusuf, O Muhammad. Verily it is I, Allah, the Almighty, the all wise, and He is the one who wants to speak to your heart tonight. So I ask you, forget what I have to say, and forgive words that will distract or annoy you, and listen only to Him. And it may be the quotation from the Quran we have already. Maybe that's what you want to do in particular tonight. But listen to him. Because surely he has something to say. Inshallah. Now the way the way I'm going to talk about interfaith is through is through experience. I'll share a little stories. The stories are more easily listened to than long explanations about faith. People can latch on to stories. But before we have any stories, I have to do a bit of academic teaching, just to remind ourselves of something, because we're dealing with different religions. So let's remind ourselves what we believe as Muslims. We, and, and for those who are not Muslim, you know, we offer this to you as an explanation. Muslims believe that Islam is the natural religion of mankind. That it has existed since the beginning of time. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not the founder of Islam. Muslims believe that Islam has existed since Adam was created. And as we said last night, its message is very simple, that there is a God, and that God speaks to his creation. That's the message of Islam. There is a God who is to be worshipped, and he speaks to his creation to the prophets. That's the story, the message of Islam. And Islam is for all people, for all time. And it speaks to the hearts of all people. And throughout history, this is important now, because this is where we get into, everyone can kind of agree about that part, but we're getting the problem now, because Allah Almighty has spoken to his creation throughout history, through different prophets. And those, we can name them, we can name them as Moses, Jesus, Abraham, David, Solomon, Jesus, peace be upon them all. And in fact, as a Muslim, I could say quite happily, as could you, I bear witness that there is no God of Allah, and I bear witness that Moses is the messenger of Allah. As Muslims, we can all say that, because we believe it. As Muslims, we can say, I bear witness that there is no God of Allah, and I bear witness that Jesus is the messenger of Allah. We believe that as Muslims. So we believe that Almighty God has spoken to his creation through the centuries. So how do we end up then with Christians, Muslims, and Jews? Where does that come from? Well, I'll just give you a thought, you know, because those three religions, they have different messages. They, they disagree with one another. For example, Christianity teaches that Jesus died on the cross. Islam teaches in the Holy Quran of a certainty they crucified him not. 
Muslims believe that Jesus did not die on the cross. Well, they can't both be right. They can't both be right. One of them's got to be wrong. He either did die on the cross or he didn't. And we'll come across this later on. Very important here. You know, all religions are equally worthy of respect. But if all religions are equal, then all religions are equally unimportant. That's very important. It's important to remember all these things. If all religions are equal, well, they're all equally unimportant because they have nothing to say to man and woman in our days. One of them has to be right. Because they disagree on major things. So how have we got three messages? So does it make sense that Almighty God, Allah, would give different messages to his creation? Does that make sense? What would he give three different messages for? To trick them? To confuse people? Why would he do it? The sensible thing is that he gave one message. So one of them is right. And that somewhere on the way, the other two got a little bit misled. Now, we're just laying out the stall at the beginning. This is the teaching of Islam. We believe, as Muslims, that Almighty God, Allah, spoke to his people throughout the centuries, and he revealed messages to them to a particular people at a particular time in history. So to the Jews of Moses' day, he gave revelation. And it was intended for the Jews at that particular time. To another time, he spoke to Jesus, peace be upon him, with a message for the children of Israel at that particular time in their history. Now, as Muslims, we believe that because those messages were, were limited to a particular time, they were not preserved in their entirety by Allah Almighty. Some people use the word these books were corrupted. I don't like that word because it's offensive to people with other beliefs. We'll, we'll just say they became altered over time. They became altered either deliberately or through translation or through what bits got lost or added to. And the message got changed. But as Muslims, we believe that the Quran is the final message of Allah Almighty to mankind and it's intended for all people and for all time so it is totally unaltered since the time it was revealed. And we can look at any copy of the Quran from any century or any country and see that it's exactly, exactly the same as it was in the beginning. Whereas the other scriptures don't exist in their original form at all, really. Maybe some years after, look at the bits of the, of the Christian scriptures from some time after they were written, and so on. And through translation or whatever reason, the meaning has become altered. Uh, what we can say as Muslims is that if the Old and the New Testament agree with what is in the Quran, we believe them to be true. If they disagree with what is in the Holy Quran, we believe them to be false. And if they say something in the Old and New Testament that are not to be found in the Quran, we don't know whether they're true or not and we don't know where they came from, so we can't really talk about them. And most of the Old and New Testament, most of it isn't found in the Quran. So most of it we can't really comment upon. So I hope that's clear, that the Muslim position is quite clear. We believe that Allah Almighty has revealed Himself to us throughout the centuries. But the message intended for particular generations and the time to help them live good lives wasn't preserved in its entirety because it wasn't meant to be. But the Quran was preserved and is exactly as it was revealed 14 centuries ago. Mm -hmm. Now that's the that's the most important position. And what we I, I'll use a phrase from the Roman Catholic Church, the Second Vatican Council, it talks about the fullness of revelation. As Muslims we believe that the Quran gives us the fullness of revelation. There's a little bit of revelation in the in the other scriptures. But the complete message is to be found in the Quran. Now that's as academic as I'm going to get. I hope, I hope you're still with me. It's important to remember that as we carry on. The rest of the thing is 
playing the same one, really. I'm going to give it in, in its story. So. I just come from dinner, having dinner with Bishop uh, Renis Bonilla, the assistant Anglican Bishop of Singapore. And we had a lovely, lovely meal. And we talked about faith. And he asked me many honest questions. What do Muslims believe about Jesus? What does it say in the Quran about this? You know, what do you think about this? What should we do? It was truly an excellent meal. And we ended, we prayed before we had our food. And we ended it by asking Almighty God to bless one another. And he sends his very best wishes to the Muslims of Singapore. More of that may be annoying. But that's, it's significant that for this particular talk on faith, when I, last time I came to Singapore, it was difficult for me to arrange meetings with the other religious leaders. So this time, I thought I'd go about it another way. Instead of writing to myself, I got in touch with the Anglican bishop in Cairo, who I know very well, and said, I'm going to Singapore, can you put me in touch with the bishop there? And he did, he telephoned him. The bishop emailed me and said, come to dinner. Well, that's interfaith dialogue. That's real interfaith dialogue. It's very important. Interfaith dialogue without friendship is you're heading for disaster. All you're heading for is arguing. You know? The bishop and I disagree profoundly on what we both believe. But we respected one another totally. I said to him very clearly, I believe that what you believe is wrong. <laughs> and I said, I know that you believe what I believe is wrong. <laughs> but let us be friends. And we can't be as friends because faith is too important to drive people apart. In a world divided by interreligious strife and religious intolerance, people of faith are far more in common with each other than with the secular forces who would do away with religion altogether. We are stronger together. We believe in God. There are people in the street outside who don't even believe in a creator. We believe in God. Together we are strong. Divided and fighting, our voices are small and insignificant. So if for no other reason you know, at the base reason, we have to get on together because we live next door to one another. We'd be stupid not to get on with the people we live next door to. At that very base level, dialogue is very important. But there's also a much more profound reason of why it's important. So let me give you my first story. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I got an email from the Patriarch of Constantinople. His old holiness, Dr. Bologna the first. Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and the ecumenical patriarch, uh, is, is the spiritual leader of 350 million Greek Orthodox Christians in the world. He's a big fish. <laughs> and and the, he, he, in fact, he is to the, to the Western Church, to the Eastern Church, what the Pope of Rome is to the Western Church. The, church, the Christian Church split in two in 1054, and the Bishop of Rome led the, the Western Church and the, the Archbishop of Constantinople led the Eastern Church and had been apart ever since for a thousand years. The first time I met the, the Patriarch was maybe three years ago. And I was visiting Istanbul in Istanbul. At the invitation of Harun Yahya, you've heard of Harun Yahya, the Muslim writer, who, who, he writes about creationism and Darwin and that sort of thing. And he invited me to Istanbul to make a like television program. So I went and we made the program. That's another talk. I can tell you lots about that episode, but not to me. That would be another that be another one. But while I was there, I did what I also what I always do, like I did today. Wherever I travel, I like to extend a hand of friendship to other religious leaders. So I went to meet his old holiness, the patriarch of Constantinople, And I visited his palace on the Bosporus. I was taken to this great building, and I was taken by liberated young men with white gloves who were dressed in uniforms through the plush carpet this thick, through the corridors and chandeliers, up to the, uh, to the office of the Patriarch. 
And the patriarch of Italy is a very respectable Muslim leader down here. A very lovely old man. He's old now. And uh, I, I greeted him. I said, so I you honor me and you honor all Muslims by the future. And on behalf of all Muslims, I greet you. And I wish peace on this place. And I was supposed to spend the 20 minutes. I stayed for his talk for an hour. And in the end of the hour, he said, now you must have a tour of the, the compound. So they took me to the cathedral and checked me the icons and everything. And then when that was finished, he said, and now you must stay for lunch. So 20 minutes ended up as three hours. And I sat on this table, a great big long table in the, in the patriarchal dining room, with his old holiness at one end, with a big gold medal and a big hat on his head. And all down the, the, the side were metropolitans and, and bishops of the Orthodox Church, all with medals and hats. There was I sitting at the end, and, and, and the, the crockery, had the, the patriarchal coat of arms in gold. And it's, I thought, well, it's great to you come a long way, at you sit and be it. <laughs> by, by the time we finished, um, I, I, uh, I, I said to him, uh, or Holiness, I said, because I was living in Damascus at the time, I said, I brought you a gift. Now, in Egypt, we have little wooden boxes made of mud and foam and wood, and they're very beautiful gifts. But in Damascus, they have the same wooden boxes, but there's no mud of foam, it's different swirling Arabic and different colors of wood. You've seen them, I've seen them in, in uh, shops in, in Singapore, in fact. Beautiful wooden boxes. So what I did was, I, I brought a box, and I put in it some of my books, some of the little books. And there was a gap between the books and the box, so I stuffed the gap with chocolates. <laughs> so I closed the box, and I said, oh, no, yes, I have a gift. Oh, you didn't need to bring me a gift. <laughs> I said, no, I have a gift. I hope you have a very sweet tooth, <laughs> because Islam is very sweet. <laughs> Oh, can we eat them now? He said, I said, no, but then we do them. And as I was leaving, this man, he's the head of 350 million Greek Orthodox Christians. As we were leaving,